if if the the field of origin of life in terms of these natural explanations is is really going nowhere, and I, I hear other people like James Tor saying the same thing, um, I guess the question is what what would it take for design to kind of be taken seriously? Um, because I think there's almost a you know a, a, an aesthetic problem that a lot of people have with the whole idea of moving from kind of trying to find purely physical explanations for the origins of life to what some people imagine, I think, as sort of a divine hand kind of basically putting a set of amino acids in the right place and in the right order and kind of creating, you know, sort of intervening at that point, And then we can let natural forces take over or, or whatever. I mean, I think a lot of people just don't like the implication that God had to poke around in the natural order to get this going. It doesn't feel right. Even I even hear this from some Christians who don't like the sure, idea of, of a kind of intervention in that way. Yeah, it is, but essentially that's an aesthetic objection. You know, I would prefer that it, that the situation were otherwise. You know, um, I've I've had some really nice interactions with Thomas Nagel, who's an extremely honest atheist, and he's famous for saying, "I just simply do not want the universe to be the kind of place in which there is a person such as God." And I think, well, fair enough. I and um, and and of course the the problem of imagining exactly what this looked like when it happened is not something that the theory of intelligent design can can help people with our theory is a theory that that it retrodicts from effects back to a kind of cause uh without depicting in toto uh exactly how the mind interfaced with matter um in defense of that i would say that um uh, you and I are doing something right now that is equally mysterious. None of us know, it's called the mind-body problem in philosophy. None of us know how our mental states, our intentionality generates uh, information or physical actions in in real time. We, that interface between mind and and physical brain is is not understood. But we can infer the action of a mind from the effects of a mind and the effects that a mind leaves behind in the physical world. We do that all the time. And that's what the theory of intelligent design does without attempting to answer the question, well, how does how did the mind of God interface with matter? What would it have looked like if you were there when when the, the, the molecules were were finding themselves into the into a proper arrangement to create a living cell? Um, you know, so I am afraid we can't help anyone with that, but we do we do want to argue that there is strong evidence that a mind played a role, even if we don't know exactly how to envision what that would have looked like when it when it took place. So I understand the aesthetic objection, our preference. It's easier to 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 you know hope that uh, you know we can somehow imagine some chemical reaction. But as James Tours pointed out, you know everything we know about chemistry shows that chemistry does not move in a life tropic, life friendly direction. Uh, and the molecules don't care about life, as he likes to say that. Uh, and so we have to take what nature is telling us seriously. One person I just want us to maybe finish by sort of talking about in this respect, someone I've had a, a number of interesting conversations with is Paul Davis, and um, he's obviously a, a popularizer in this area. Um, I think he's been very shy of uh, being sort of, you know, associated with intelligent design, but and he doesn't like the word God, I think, but he does seem to be reaching out for something transcendent when it comes to the way in which the universe has been organized and one of the recent conversations i had with him on the subject of the origins of life he said this which i felt was a really interesting statement he said the directionality in the universe going from matter to life to consciousness he said i would also add comprehension to that there's an arrow of time in the direction of comprehension and if that is the case if this is not just an enormous fluke a happy series of accidents then that to me comes very close to something like a meaning or purpose in nature. He said, I think that's a sort of religious feeling, what Einstein called a cosmic religious feeling. I mean, I mean, what do you think about that idea that, yeah, because it, it, for me, that's one of the main things is it's when we even talk about the origins of life, why, why does inanimate matter go to all the trouble of becoming self-replicating and then becoming conscious and then becoming self-reflecting uh, and able to even understand, you know, it's, it seems like that itself just seems like a, an interesting fact about the universe that it, it has it this propensity feels, it feels and directed which is to mm. say teleological which is to say designed you know one of the most famous quotes from davies is the, the impression of design is overwhelming speaking about the fine tuning 
Um, I've been at a conference with him. He's a very thoughtful guy. Uh, his book, The Fifth Miracle, is it's it's almost the same argument that I make in Signature in the Cell. He comes to the water's edge and then sling, pulls back from saying the most what I would regard as the most logical conclusion of the analysis. But he he's he's also focusing on the importance of explaining specified complexity. And sometimes people have said, oh, this idea of specified complexity or specified information or functional information, this is just an, a concept that intelligent design people have dreamed up. Well, no, the, the term came from Leslie Orgel, one of the leading origin of life researchers, who said, we, we, unlike life is not like a crystal that has repetitive order. It's not like a static coming over a radio signal. It's not merely complex. It's complex, but also specified to, to ensure the performance of an independent function. And that's what needs to be explained. Schrodinger talked about aperiodic crystals in life itself, in, or in, uh, in his book, in, in, uh, sorry, uh, What is Life in 1944. Um, and, and, and in The Fifth Miracle, Davies talks about it. So people universally are recognizing the phenomenon that needs to be explained. That is specified complexity or specified information or functional information. And in our, my argument has been that in our experience, we know one and only one known cause for the origin of that entity, and that is mind. And therefore, when we find that at the foundation of life, we have powerful indicator of the activity of the designing intelligence in the origin of life. And indeed, I would say in the history of life, because we have these big jumps in complexity that require further inputs of information. And so I think, whereas in the 19th century, Scientists portrayed the universe, the scientific cosmology, if you will, prized matter and energy as the fundamental realities. I think in 21st century biology and in cosmology, we now recognize that we have three fundamental entities. We have matter, energy, and also information. And given that information in our experience is a mind product, I think what we're looking at is a return of what I call the God hypothesis, that we need uh, both an active and a transcendent mind to explain the information that we find in those three domains of biology, physics, and uh, also cosmology. I mean, just as we conclude, and thank you so much for your time. Appreciate giving me so much time, Steve, tonight. Um, my my book is called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. It touches on science, but lots of other areas where I see there being a kind of a new openness to, to God as an explanation for things. Um in the science community, then, uh, do you think that we are moving in a similar direction that that actually, you know, through things like the fact that the neo-Darwinian synthesis just doesn't seem to be holding water anymore, the fact that we are having these extraordinary, you know, revelations about the nature of our universe and so on. Do you think that's actually coming back to God? Um, is that the where people are ultimately landing? Um or will it take, I don't know, they say science progresses one funeral at a time, maybe it'll take a few generations before there's an openness well, to that. I see that happening in my, my experience, not only among some very seasoned and senior scientists who have had conversions. I mean, my interest in this whole topic began when I was early in my career, and I attended a conference where Alan Sandage announced, his public, uh, announced publicly his conversion to Christianity not in spite of scientific evidence, but because of it. He was a, a pretty well-known, hard-bitten scientific materialist who began to have a real deep and deliberative um, set of conversations with colleagues about the meaning of the new cosmology. And he realized that there was something in him that did not want there to be a beginning to the universe. And he realized that the reason for that was it had obvious metaphysical implications. Um, at that same conference, Dean Kenyon announced that he had repudiated his own theory of chemical evolution and was uh, was uh, as, and, and stated that it was now time for the, the theologians to open reopen the, or the philosophers to reopen the natural theological conversation and that he himself was becoming sympathetic to the design hypothesis. So I began that's, that was, you know, very early in my career in the mid 80s. And so I've had the 35 years to think about this, and I found that there are many, many scientists who have been on that same exact trajectory. Gunter Beckley, as I mentioned, um, I, I think Jim Tour, who has been a, a believer for a long time, but is I think increasingly interested in these these origins questions and seeing that they they do not point in the materialistic direction. Um, and uh, and the other thing I'm seeing is that a lot of younger people. We have these summer programs for young people, 
and we're att- attracting an incredible amount of uh, very energetic talent. And I, I think people are ready for, to look at biology in particular in a new way. Uh, biology, systems biology is a big new direction. And I think looking at biology as a design system uh, leads to making predictions that can be tested in the laboratory. It leads to new approaches to studying life. And so it's, it's not just a matter of saying God did it. It's a matter of saying, well, there, if life was designed, then what else should we expect to find? Maybe that junk DNA isn't going to turn out to be junk after all, just to name one example. And it didn't, you know, so that was an ID prediction. So anyway, I think it's a new day in science and there's a tremendous amount of energy around these, the, the, looking at life as a design system, looking at the universe as a design system, and then seeing where that leads. That is taking us back full circle to the, the scientific revolution. Uh, Newton's God hypothesis was not a science stopper. It was a science starter for him. And you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone in the history of science who was more productive than, than, than Newton was.